Hi everybody, I'm Rachel from Treehouse Knits and welcome to the Treehouse Knits podcast. We are on episode four and I'm so glad that you've joined me today. Today we will be talking about what's on my mannequins. We'll also be talking a little bit about um, some works in progress that I have as well as an acquisition and then we'll jump into the first part of our sheepy segment where we'll talk just briefly an overview of sheep. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more of that segment and what I'm looking to do in the future with it at that point. But why don't we just jump right in and talk about what's on my mannequins. My mannequin, Elsie over here, has my Lady Entrelock, Lady Eleanor stole. And this is an Entrelock stole that was in this book or is in this book called Scarf Style by Pam Allen. It's an older book. I'm not sure when it was published, but it's pretty old um, because at the time Pam Allen was the editor of Interweave Knits and now a lot of us know that she is the um, creator of Quince Yarn. This is what it looked like in the book. And this is how mine turned out. I did it exactly like the pattern called for with this really cool fringe. Um, I made this about six years ago when I lived in Tacoma, Washington. It was one of my big first projects. And I used a yarn called Jojo Land Rhythm. It's a worsted weight yarn and this big boy used about 1100 yards of Jojo Land Rhythm. It was a very cool first project for Entrelac and once I got started and got over the intimidation factor uh, I really enjoyed it and really I don't wear it out much it's kind of big and looks really big on me but I love to have it just hanging over my couch on a chilly evening. So that's the Lady Eleanor scarf. And again, just a reminder, you can find all of my projects on Ravelry. I'm Treehouse Knits on Ravelry, and I do keep my projects really up to date. I enjoy Ravelry, and I love to see what I've completed and just keep inventory of all my projects. So you'll get all the information if you go to Treehouse Knits on Ravelry. On Emma over here, and again, Elsie and Emma were my grandmother and great-grandmother on my mom's side. This is the Rosebud hat. Rosebud was designed by Jared Flood. I believe it was in the Brooklyn Tweed Fall 11 collection that came out. And I did it in shelter, as was um, done in the pattern. A couple things. This was my first time using shelter. And one thing that I learned when you're using shelter or I bet any woolen spun Targi Columbia blend, which is what shelter is, what type of sheep, I use smaller needles for the rim, the brim, and then I go up a couple needle sizes for the, the hat. And it might have said to do that in the pattern. And at the time I made this, I probably didn't have that size and thought, you know, why would I bother doing that? Well, it's important. You can kind of see that it's a really loose hat. It fits my head well. I have a very big head, lots of hair. So I love how it looks on me, but I think the average person's head, um, it would probably fall down over their eyes. But this was such a nice, easy, great pattern. Again, it's just got a regular two by two ribbing, lots of just knitting and purling to make that garter stitch in the round. You know that when you want to make garter stitch in the round, you have to knit a row, knit around, and then purl around. Unlike when you're making something flat, like a, a garter stitch scarf or, or a blanket, you just knit all rows back and forth. But when you're in the round, you have to knit and purl. And then there was this panel of this really pretty, I'm assuming that's what's supposed to be the rosebud that grew out of the ribbing. Love how the designer did that. Um, and that when you do it on your circular needles, you just separate this section with a couple stitch markers and know to refer to your chart to make the cable. And there's two little cables 
on the alongside as well. So great, I think, beginning pattern for a person who wants to learn how to cable because you only have to do it once and then you got a few rounds where you don't have to worry about the, the cable. So that's my rosebud, Jared Flood. So in terms of finished objects, I currently counted, I have over 10 projects going at this time, which means I'm doing a little bit of work on a lot of things. So I don't have any finished objects this week, but I did have three projects that I wanted to show you that are works in progress. So the first, just wanted to give you an update on my sweater. This is my sweater by Heidi Kermeyer called Quicksand. Here's what it looks like. It's not gonna be striped. That's just the way my printer printed things out. Clearly I need to change my color cartridge. It is coming along. I am making it out of the most gorgeous yarn by Woolfolk called Far. It is a beautiful, beautiful yarn. Soft, I absolutely love working on this project. Usually when I'm working on a sweater, I get really tired of it by this point and I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should just make the sweater short sleeved or three quarter length because I, I just dread the thought of having to do all the sleeves yet too. But honestly, I love working with this yarn so much that I just, I'm already thinking about what else I can make with it. It's just light and airy, stretchy because of the construction of the yarn. In my last episode, I talked about how it's not a spun yarn, but it's a, um, a braided yarn. It's got a lot of spring to it, a lot of loft, which just makes it a light, but I'm sure this is gonna be a really warm sweater. I love the color I picked out too. Um, it's gray, 003 is the color. And I really can't say enough about this pattern. It's just a basic, easy pattern where you're just increasing around the yoke, separating for the sleeves, working your way down. I'm to a point now where I'll be doing a little bit of short rows down at the bottom. And for those of you who have not done short rows before, it's really just knitting back and forth without going end to end. And it just creates a little bit more fabric in the back, which will make for some really nice shaping for this sweater. I love the sweater and uh, if you have any other questions about it, just feel free to refer to my Ravelry page where I've got more information about it. Uh, I think that is really all. This would be a great beginner sweater, by the way, um, because it's just basic top-down construction, no seaming. And I am going to knit it uh, long sleeve. So that is my Quicksand by Heidi Kermeyer. I'm storing it in one of my favorite project bags. Um, by Hopkins Sewing Studio, my Chicago bag, Chicago L map on the front there, and just various landmarks around it. All right, so the next project I want to show you, I've got a couple of socks that I've just started. My first sock I'm housing in my Treehouse Knits bag that I make, that I made. And this is a yarn by Opal. Let me see if I have, I'll just put this up for you to see. It is Shoffpate 5, color 729, uh, 7255, and I think it's called Paula. And I just love, love, love how these are knitting up. It just looks like a Midwest fall sunrise or pumpkin patch. Oh, I just love it. I'm doing it toe up, two at a time, obviously, on the magic loop, my preferred way to make socks. I've done a, um, a rounder toe by increasing quickly in the beginning of the increases and then increasing every other round as you get to your primary stitch count, which I'm doing these, let's see, I'm knitting these on my uh, favorite needles. These are my Addy Sock Rockets and I'm doing them on a size one because it's a little bit thicker yarn and I love the Sock Rockets. I love the point. You know, I love Sock Rockets. Those are definitely my favorite and I think they're just a little superior to the ones that everybody loves right now. 
Oh, everybody's shouting them out. And I do have a few pairs of them. The Haya Haya Sharps. The only difference is in the needle coating. I just like how this slides when my needles hit a little bit better than the Haya Haya Sharps, but I love the Haya Haya Sharps too. So that's just my two cents. But these are turning out really nicely. Love the pattern. And the way that I do my toe up two at a time, a lot of people are intimidated by two at a time. And I think the intimidation comes from two parts. One is the, if you're doing them toe up, it's Judy's Magic Cast On, and there's a, a little bit of a learning curve there. But once you've done it a few times, it it's really second nature. The other thing that I think a lot of people are scared about two at a time is just the yarn management and the yarn getting all twisted about. My the way that I manage my yarn is in a bag this size and what I do is I roll it over and you can see I've got my two skeins in there. I like this size bag. I think this is about a nine inch wide bag because I can put my two skeins in there. They sit in there comfortably but tight so they don't move around a lot. The center pull is key. You don't you don't want to have uh, you know yarn coming around and grabbing the other skein and then as i work i go across and i just turn the bag with my work or i turn once and turn back around again as i'm working just being very mindful of that if if you can manage your yarn in that way you will end up knitting extremely fast socks faster than i think any other method and um I don't know it's just a lot of fun because at the end you've got your two socks done that's just my two cents on knitting toe up two at a time socks so that is uh, my first project on socks and the second socks that I have going on are um, it's actually a uh, acquisition that I had I had a couple of acquisitions in the last couple of weeks the first is this skein of yarn I have it caked up already Look at the colors in there, it's gorgeous. This is a yarn from Legacy Fiber Arts, and it is their Sweater Weather colorway. I especially love the purple in it, so I decided for this pair of socks, I wanted to pull that purple out. And I'll show you how they are coming along. I am pulling that purple out by making toes he and heels, not the cuffs, with some frolicking feet by Dunn Roving in the gray slate. You can see how much I paid for it there. In the gray slate color. There it is. And I absolutely love, love, love the way, you see needle management? That would drive people crazy. Before I start working on this project, I make sure that it's all aligned. But here they are. I have my little owl stitch marker on there. I just love the way that purple is pulling out the, the purple toe is pulling out the purple. And these, these are gonna be gorgeous. And I think they might be my favorite pair of socks I've ever knit so far, color-wise. I am using, actually for these, I'm using a pair of Addy's 47 inch, and this is the lace sock. They work, or the lace needle. They work well for socks too. Not as well, in my opinion, as the sock rockets. These have, a, if you can see, they're gold. I'm not a huge fan of the gold. For some reason, it just feels a little bit different, but they work really well not going to complain <laughs> too much but these are um, actually my 22nd pair of the year of socks that I've knit this year <laughs> I'm part of the box of socks cal by um, hosted by Vullenvine Kristen and uh, yeah I'm up to this is sock pair of socks number 22 for that all right so those are the three projects that I have well, that I want to show to you today on my needles. And uh, let's move on to acquisitions. I really haven't gotten out much. I'm headed on Friday to a local yarn store to pick up a few things. But um, this past week, the only thing that I got in the mail was this skein of yarn, again, from Legacy Fiber Arts. And this is, your, this is called Your Father's on the Naughty List. 
This is part of a series based on the movie Elf that they had an update on, I think a couple weeks ago now. And I just really thought, I loved the, the reds and the pinks and the teal and the blue, especially in this. This is in their Cozy Toes base, which is an 801010 Merino cashmere nylon. So I might make myself my first pair of cashmere socks. I think that would be kind of fun. So again, Legacy Fiber Arts. So that is it for what I'm working on. I have some other stuff that I'm working on, but I'll share, with, um, share that with you uh, maybe next time. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about my sheep series that I'm hoping to do, this sheep segment. I've recently become a little more interested in understanding the sheep, especially in this area where I live in Michigan in the United States. Uh, about four or five years ago, we moved here from the other side of the country. And um, I've just been curious about what kind of sheep are living in the state of Michigan. And then it led me to think, well, I don't know a lot about sheep. And I think it would be really important for me to understand as a consumer of yarn and primarily wool. Wool is definitely my favorite, favorite fiber to work with. I thought it's just important to get to know some of the farmers in the area, some of the shepherds and shepherdesses that raise these sheep and understand the different breeds of sheep, which breeds are more common, which are rare, what characteristics do the different wools have, um, and that will help me in my yarn selection going forward for projects based on what I'm looking for. I also thought it's really important to put my money, um, direct my money to areas where I want to keep going. And I just have the greatest admiration for farmers out there who are keeping livestock alive and with shepherds, they're doing it for love. I mean, really, they're not in it for the money. And well, at least the farms that I'm hoping to <laughs> go to in Michigan. And I just want to support them and make sure that they can continue to thrive and grow and share what they love with the rest of us. So I started to embark on a little bit of research on sheep overall. And I did my race research primarily in three areas. The first is I'm reading through this fleece and fiber source book. And it is a book by Deborah Robson and Carol Acarius. I've been told that this is a, a real important book to have in my library um, and that it'll be a definite reference guide for when I'm researching different breeds of sheep. And I also found a couple sites online that maybe you've heard of, but they were newer to me and they contain a wealth of information. The first is sheep101.info. That is a website that the creators have made to help 4-H students and others who are looking to um, perhaps have their own flock of sheep, a resource for them to go to to learn more about sheep and the different breeds. And then the other area that I, uh, other website I looked at was the livestockconservancy.com and that website and that group, that organization, their purpose is to maintain a record of heritage breed sheep. So those are sheep that have not been bred over time to improve the amount of wool or the quality of wool. Uh, or the quality of meat. They've not been um, bred over time. These are the sheep that they say were in our great great grandparents' farms. So, and they have a list of sheep, the different uh, types of sheep that are on the rare or you know, extinct list. They have a really nice list going there. So, I refer to that as well. But I just wanted to briefly talk about sheep in general and sheep over time, his, the history of sheep, I guess you could say. I found out that sheep, only second to dogs, sheep were the second, or what we know of as the second mammal on this earth to become domesticated. And based on archeological records, it looks like it was around 8,000 BC that sheep began to be domesticated. And what I mean by that is 
prior to that, sheep were roaming free and they were able to shed their own hair, they were able to forage for their own food, and they, they were self-sustaining. Around 8000 BC, people started to bring them into their homes and their farms and breed them for their wool, for their meat. So 8000 BC, they've found wool clothing, um, which was worn in Babylon. The yarn was spun on drop spindles. We're talking 4000 BC. In 55 BC, sheep were introduced to the British Isles. In 1200 AD, the spinning wheel was invented. So prior to that, they were using different methods to create yarn to weave. And I assuming it was the drop spindle. What I find fascinating too is that sheep were then a huge component of colonization. And from this point, my research kind of took a spin and just kind of looked towards the United States of America and the sheep that we have here today. From my research, I found that we have about 50 different breeds of sheep that you can find in the United States, but there are over a thousand different breeds of sheep in the world. But when um, Europeans were coming to America to colonize, they brought sheep with them. It was one of the few livestock that they brought. They um, considered them to be, I forget what the term was, but if you had a sheep, you could use it for its wool, you could use it to eat from, um, even its milk. You could, it was just a, a walking way of sustenance for the colonies. In 1493, Columbus definitely took sheep to Cuba on his second voyage there. Cortez took sheep into Mexico, and sheep from these flocks eventually found their way to the southwest, where they were the beginning of the Navajo weaving that is still um, something that we treasure today. What's also interesting is in the early 1600s, England actually forbid the import of sheep to America because they wanted to control the production of clothing for export to the colonies and keep them dependent on England. Um, during this time, wool fabric made up of two thirds of England's trade. So it was so important to them for their financial well being, the sheep and its wool that they knew that if they allowed their colonies to start producing, that would take away from their, their treasury. So in, in very interesting, in 1635, the pilgrims brought sheep from the Dutch and actually smuggled them into the colonies. They weren't allowed to have sheep, sheep from England, but they smuggled them in. It was so important to them. By 1643, there were a thousand sheep in Massachusetts. 21 years later, there were over 100,000 sheep. So that just took 21 years to increase it that much. In 1664 AD, the colonies passed a law requiring youth to learn to spin and weave wool so the colonists could become self-sufficient. And I thought it was interesting too. It took four girl spinners, so the girls were taught how to spin. It took four girl spinners to produce enough yarn to keep one boy weaver, the boys learned how to weave, keep one boy weaver busy, busily supplied. So it was mandated that the youth in the colonies had to learn how to create fabric out of wool. And then in the mid 1700s, as the American wool trade grew, the English made raising sheep and trading wool in um, and trading wool a crime punishable by cutting the offender's right hand off. Whoa! <laughs> English restrictions of sheep and wool was one of the major factors leading to the American Revolution. I thought it was kind of ironic that it was also tea and the Boston Tea Party that was another reason we had a revolution the American Revolution, and I just think now how tea and knitting are just so closely related. Well, they set off a revolution. Wearing, I thought this was cool too, wearing homespun wool garments became a symbol of protest against England. Now, we love our English knitting friends, and I hope anyone watching this from England isn't offended by this, but what this says to me was the just how important sheep were to these people who were coming across the pond, trying to colonize a savage land, and they knew that the importance of, they just understood the importance of sheep and for them financially, for them just 
to meet their daily needs of being fed and clothed and um, just what a big deal it was for them during that time. What's also interesting is during that time in England, textile technology began to develop rapidly, but the export of this technology to the colonies was forbidden. So, for example, in 1733, the flying shuttle was developed. Right after that, the invention of the spinning jenny, the water frame, and then finally in 1769, the first American wool mill was established. And after the Revolutionary War, then in the 1790s, the U.S. textile industry developed rapidly. As farmers moved across the country of the United States, they definitely brought their sheep with them, and it was just a really, really important component for them to survive, providing them um, with food and with clothing. So like I said, today sheep are raised in all 50 states, the, and um, the flocks vary in size from a few, few heads of sheep to over 10,000. Of about 200 breeds of sheep in the world, only about a dozen are very important in the U.S. sheep industry. As of the timeline that I'm looking at, the top sheep raising states were Texas, Wyoming, California, South Dakota, and Colorado. The top sheep producing countries in the world are Australia and New Zealand, and in New Zealand, sheep outnumber people five to one. That is very cool. So that's just kind of an introduction to sheep, a little bit of um, sheep 101, sheep over time. I'm really excited to move forward with this segment. In a couple of weeks, I will be heading to a local farm with a shepherdess that I've been talking to a little bit out about, um, talking to on Ravelry, and I'm really looking forward to that visit. So if you're watching, Carrie, I'm very excited to learn more about your flock of Corydale. So that will be the first sheep that we touch on. I hope uh, every month I'll be able to, maybe even more often than that, visit a local sheep farm and learn a little bit about their flock, um, what's, why they chose the breed they chose, perhaps what obstacles are they facing today in raising those sheep, and anything else that they want us to learn about um, during my visit to their farm. So I hope that this will be a meaningful segment for you. Of course, I'll continue to talk about projects that I'm working on, but um, I hope that y'all look forward to meeting some of our local shepherds and shepherdesses that take care of these flocks for us and produce beautiful wool that we as hand spinners can, hand spinners and, and knitters can use and enjoy. And I just hope that's a fun segment for us all. So, I think that's all I have for you today. I hope that this video finds you all enjoying your knitting and any other creative endeavors that you have going on this week. And as always, feel free to come to the Ravelry uh, Treehouse Knits podcast forum. On there, we've got several people now that have introduced themselves. I've put their locations on our map. Come check out our map and see where all of us are located. We're all over the world. It has been so fun meeting you all. And I just, I hope that anyone who's watching this and is interested in joining in does join in. I, you can find basic show notes on the Ravelry page. And if you want to ask any questions about this particular video, feel free to ask them in that actual section on the forum. You can also find me on Instagram. I'm Treehouse Knits there. I post pretty much daily on there as well. And I just thank you so much for joining me today. Have a great week and we will talk to you soon. Bye.